Right, uh, moving on then, uh, we're going to sort of see a little bit about uh, what collaboration can do uh, in terms of rural life. Uh, Paul Sander, my next speaker, is the managing director of the Carnarvon-based company GeoShow. He's a specialist in GIS, uh, information architecture and mobile application design and development. It tells me he's going to show how his four-man business based in North Wales is able to reach markets across the world because of digital partnerships with complementary firms in California, Denmark, Scotland and South East England. Welcome, Paul. Right, thank you very much um, for giving us the opportunity to, to present what we do to you all. What we're going to try and cover are just two key things. Um, our view on collaboration um, and us, who we are, what we do, nothing too technical, I promise. Finally, we're going to try and cover how we collaborate digitally, um, how we work with others, who we work with, why, how, and what we sell and market to them. So to start off with, we're based in Carnarvon. It's in northwest Wales. We're not exactly in Silicon Valley. We've got lots of valleys, but there's not much silicon. Um, it takes us a long time to get to Cardiff. Manchester, London, Leeds are all far closer to us in terms of time. But we do live in an area that's rich in natural beauty, uh, culture and history. Our offices are right next to an 850-year-old World Heritage Castle, not exactly a prerequisite for a tech business, but uh, we're only 500 metres away from a Roman Empire's westernmost fort, so it's a, it's a historical place. The quality of life's exceptional. But what does a rural startup mean to us? Um, the things that came to mind were boutique hotels, cheese makers, mountain bike shops, um, and despite the changes that we're going to cover and lots of people have covered already this morning, we'd like to look at the key issues that need to be addressed in these perceptions that, that rural businesses are of a type. Now what we are, we um, were set up in 2010 with seed funding from Finance Wales who are just across the field um, and some private investors. We've received fantastic support um, and funding via the Welsh Assembly Government, um, our local authorities and Visit Wales as well. Our purpose is basically to develop niche products um, that have location at their core, business intelligence and analysis, um, property management, tourism, culture and heritage, public transport, skin care, that wasn't on the business plan, um, and mobile phone signal analysis. These applications basically take an organisation's existing data and content um, and create dynamic maps via web browsers, smartphones, tablets, etc. Our target markets are small organisations, the organisations that up until now weren't able to afford these, these kinds of technologies. Um, the main thing is, I think the core of us is we love maps. Their ability to inform us, to encapsulate a three-dimensional world into a sheet of paper or a laptop or a smartphone screen, it's unrivaled. I mean, our view is probably a little skewed, but we do believe the role of mapping is becoming much more prevalent in society. When I was a child, maps basically came out when we went on holiday. Um, now Google Maps, sat-navs, and the slightly less correct Apple version are becoming something that we use every day. And technology is the enabler of this, and the growth in usage and awareness of maps. To move away from the technology side a bit, this is um, an example of what happens when you live in the mountains. It gives us the ability, the luxury, oh, It gives us the luxury of being able to enjoy the landscape as a normal everyday event. This map was drawn by a friend. She wanted the children to go out and play. Um, it, was, it was a fantastic day. The children hadn't really seen a paper map before. They've played with Xboxes and iPads, but they'd not seen a paper map. And we had a lovely day. It was raining, of course. Um, and the kids got it from the age of seven to the age of 11. The children got all that information. They were able to find things, report back, and collaborate together, because obviously the teams were girls versus boys. But maps themselves, how do they inform us as, as people who work in organizations and businesses? As an example of how a map can inform us, this is something that illustrates a growing problem in Western society, obesity. 
And we can look, I um, mean, it's a problem that, that affects the Western world, it affects Britain um, and my wardrobe. We can look at lists of numbers and graphs and other staffs, but looking at a map of England that uses data on this, on this trend can inform us all of the scale of the problem. Of course, I've left Wales out because that would include my wardrobe, but just look at this over a period of time, how this problem has grown. Now, as a sheet of paper with numbers on, yes, of course, we can interpret this, but to use this explains to people not just what's happening, but more, most importantly, where it's happening. Where do we target resources? Where do we actually address that? How best to address this issue in context of location? So there we are. Anyway, maps themselves um, tell us a story. They're able to express time. They're able to express um, things that don't exist, fictional, pretend things. They're, they're magical. So I've got over that now. I think you've probably got the fact that we do like maps. We're also quite proud to say we're not geeks. Okay, we might use technology. Technology is the basis of our existence, but we're, we're not geeks. We're far too old. This is something that nearly everybody in the team has and actually uses regularly. So, so and we've just come back from the Dublin Web Summit where we were Wales' um, representative, and it was quite apparent that we weren't geeks because we didn't have the latest version of anything. So I think we were quite, quite sort of social outcasts, really. This is how many people work for our organisation four permanent members of staff. It's how we anticipated the business would be run. Um, with, I don't have any plans at the moment to grow further for the next few months. And this is what we do. The four people who are in the office do this. It's product. That's our core role. We design it, we identify requirements, we manage it, we release it, and we sell it. But that's, that's what we do. It's kind of quite boring. The conversations in our office can be quite dull. That's how many people actually support us, the people that do everything else, which we will cover when we start to look at the, at the actual roles that they fulfill and how we work together. But that was kind of quite scary because until I was asked to do this presentation, I knew we had lots of people helping us that we were paying or collaborating with. I had no idea that there were four times as many of them. So to come back to, to collaboration, what does collaboration mean? What's, what's, the, what's the, the root of this? Taking the technology out, what, what, what is it about? Really, it's derived from the Latin working together. It's, it's producing things. Why do we collaborate? We collaborate to do this. That's the sole reason. There's only four of us. We can, we're good at code. We're not too good at the other things. We need to collaborate. There's no choice in the matter. And most crucially, for the next few slides, we want to cover this. It's not specific to us and technology and digitalism. It's inbuilt. It's actually an intrinsic part of who we are. There are countless species of, plant, of fauna on this planet. According to some uh, magazines, 3.6 million species in total. But less than 25 of them actually collaborate. That's 25 out of 3.6 million. What we mean by this is that they're able to work and live together in an observable and consistent manner. These species include ants. They can have colonies of over a million ants. They can cover 100 square meters. The total biomass of all the ants on Earth is equal to us, the total biomass of humans. They're so tiny and we're so, so big but the scientists estimate that there's probably about 1.5 million ants for each one of us. So I know the iPhone stats were good, but this one's, this one's pretty damned impressive. Although not when you were at a picnic. Um, some scientists now have even speculated that there's super colonies of ants that live across continents. They've actually identified the ants by their, by their profile. So there's actual collections of colonies. Other examples, bees, um, they're basically, these, these animals, these insects, take up something like 50% of the biomass of the planet. That's less than 20 species taking up all of this part of life, the thing that we, that we belong to. Termites. 
They all have one thing in common as well. In addition to working together, sharing roles, looking after young, the other thing is they all have a nest, a hive, a colony. They live together. Termite mounds can be up to 10 metres in height. It's got its own air conditioning. Actual termite mounds have air conditioning, not the actual Hitachi units, but um, that's how clever it is, which brings us to us. Pulitzer Prize winning um, biologist Edward Wilson basically defined our nest, the essence of us, is the campfire. It's how we started off. It's how we started to collaborate. Campfires is where it all began. They are the nests that are made by human beings. And we're the animal kingdom's greatest practitioners of collaboration. It's called eusociality. We form groups concerning multiple generations and perform altruistic acts as part of our division of labour. And the focal point of these groups is, you've guessed it, a campfire. What do we have in our living rooms? We still have fires. We've got great central heating, but we still need a campfire. How did us and the ants and the termites gain our superpowers? By being super cooperators, groupies of the group, willing to set aside our small selfish desires and I minded drive to join forces and seize opportunities as a self-sacrificing self hive minded tribe. There are plenty of social animals in the world, animals that benefit by living in groups. Very few have made the leap from just being social to the way that us and the ants and the termites belong to. Our ability to form alliances, show mercy, compassion, um, risking our lives for someone not related to us are the best qualities. Slightly nicer view on it, a more current view, the, the fact that we're, we're, we collaborate, we get together. In the 21st century, we're all to lesser or greater degrees members of numerous communities, whether they're online, Facebook, Twitter, or they're the real world ones, the reading groups, the gardening clubs, the bonfire nights, etc. And bringing it to Wales, the, mind, the name for Wales in Welsh is Cymru, and the name for a Welsh person is a Cymru, and that means fellow countrymen. It's actually the name, the name in Wales for, for being Welsh is your fellow countrymen. And this is a lovely view of a, of a nice traditional Welsh um, cultural practice known as the mackerel funeral, where everybody gets together and um, buries a mackerel. Well, they actually burn it on the beach by the rugby club, but never mind. Now, we've talked about the fact that this is all good, the working together, creating good, being cohesive, actually, and how it will tie back to our company. You've got to remember that in Chicago in the 1920s and 30s, perhaps they didn't have quite such a positive spin on the benefits of collaboration, but it demonstrates the power of, of people working together, people working together in this case, not necessarily for the good of society. So, looking at more detail of, of, of in collaboration itself as humans and how it applies to work, we've sort of seen that there's two kinds of the literature that we've read, the two kinds of collaboration. The first one is ad hoc. It's temporary, it's um, immediate, it's informal. And it struck me when we we're trying to think of examples of, of ad hoc collaboration, although there are instances at work, that there was actually something that happened this summer. Um, it was a rare occasion, the sun was out, and it's something that I'd done ever since moving to Wales. It's collecting the hay. Chip is our neighbour, so is Kellen, and there were another ten of us, and Chip gives us a phone call, couldn't do that 10,000 years ago when they were collecting hay, but gives us a phone call and says, come round. And probably 15 or 16 of us will go to Chip's farm and collect hay. He's not a farmer, he's a power station manager. There's no health and safety training or equipment. Um, there's, there's division of labour. The, the grandparents complain at our low work rate, look after the children. Um, it's, it's an ad hoc collaboration and it struck me that the people living in our, our houses, even from 100 years ago, 200 years ago, were probably doing the same thing. When something needed to be done, they were collaborating. It's, it doesn't require a manual, it doesn't require a contract, it's just, I need help now to get something done. And particularly this summer, when the sun came out, everybody did turn up. And what's really crucial to this is distance. For ad hoc collaboration in the real world to, to work, in our opinion, is things have to be nearby. It's difficult to, to do an ad hoc collaboration um, when things are distant. It might be great on Facebook, but I wouldn't really regard that as collaboration. Chip's farm's there, he's got the big icon. The distance between all these points is only a couple of kilometres. 
Um, perhaps 100 years ago, it might have only been half a kilometre or a kilometre, but that sort of is an example of how important distance, physical distance between people or organisations can actually impact on this. It has to be close, nearby. It, it, it's, these are the words that we'd associate with ad hoc collaboration. Moving more into the world of work, organised collaboration. They produce re results far beyond the achievements of ad hoc. Um, and, but before we look at it, one thing I do want to stress is that organised collaboration in our view, particularly from our organisation, does not mean implementation by committee. Another bringing it to Wales, because this is where we are. I'm not sure how many of you have heard of Istedvodai or Istedvods. It's um, a cultural Olympics. Um, it's a unique annual and so cultural and social event that's held in Wales. And the earliest one was uh, held in Cardigan in the 11th century. So Glastonbury has some way to go yet. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands of people attend the two main nationalist Edvodai. Um, and to make matters more difficult, they get held in a different location in Wales every year. What do they do there? They celebrate poetry, dance, music, art. And when you're a teenager, there is an alternative site just on the other side where basically I just remember celebrating drink. But the key thing about this is that this, even though it only occurs in the summer, already now across Wales, there are people, both paid and unpaid, who are collaborating together to produce this. They are actually working at school level, community level, organisation level. There are committees for this, there are different levels of competition. Our children already have to go to the practices in school. This is taken very seriously, and it's been going on for 800 years. So getting back to us as a, as a group of, uh, as, a, as a species, we've evolved from hunter-gatherer to geek, basically. That seems to be being the trend of, of what we've been learning about today. Man the Food Gatherer appears incongruously as information gatherer, remarked Marshall McLuhan, who is a Canadian philosopher who was quite prophetic in the early 60s. Our world runs on information, it depends on it. Let's just look at a few in terms of organised collaboration, digital, getting down to the nitty gritty. A few of the hundreds of open source software projects, the Apache web server, are quite happy to, I'd love to know that not many of you know what it is, but it's basically running the web. Whether you're on Amazon or you're on Wikipedia or you're on our website, most websites, I think it's something like eight out of 10 in the world run an Apache, completely unknown. But it's not a commercial product. It's been made by people collaborating together in an organized fashion. Linux is the operating system that runs an awful lot of the web. Something like 65% of all websites are now run on WordPress. Again, an open source collaboration. These endeavors finely tuned create high quality products from the coordinated work of thousands, and in some cases, tens of thousands of members. One of our developers in a previous company was a, Microsoft, was a Mozilla Firefox developer. And there was a poster, a massive poster, which had a little tiny bit of his name on it. It was his pride and joy in the office because he was part of the team that created Mozilla Firefox. And it also got him a much better job because it was on his CV. He was working with some of the best developers in the world, so it wasn't entirely altruistic. Um, enthusiasts, they might, might spend months writing code for a subroutine when the program's full utility is several years away. So the work reward ratio is so out of kilter from a free market perspective. The workers do immense amounts of high market value work without being paid. But then on the other side, although everybody thinks it's for nothing, IBM, for instance, from what I understand, there's an awful lot of people being paid by IBM to work in Eclipse, which is what software developers use. So it's not just work for nothing. But the results over the last 10 years of these products, which are the fundament of our business, have been quite amazing. This is a product that we don't use, so it's not an endorsement, but it's massively popular. It's called Drupal. It's got an awful brand logo. It scares me. But it's the, the owner is, is, is um, one of those people who doesn't profess to be an expert, but what he says seems to, to ring a bell with me. He's, I can't pronounce his name. I'm very sorry. It's Dries Butart, but he says that the strongest asset of this business, even though it's open source, is its community, the people that work together. In doing this, open source delivers in innovative solutions to business problems much faster and much cheaper in most cases than the actual commercial sector. 
Drupal is supported by an active community of developers. This is active, not just some statistic. People who are submitting code every week of 16,000 people around the world. Getting close to where we are, this is called OpenStreetMap. And I think this really demonstrates the ability to digitally collaborate together and produce something that we can all consume. Everybody knows about Google Maps, Ordnance Survey, and Apple. Um, but not many people know about this. Um, it's called OpenStreetMap. It's been produced entirely by people and GPSs and smartphones. It was um, founded in 2004 by a guy called Steve Coast, who now works for Microsoft. And in April 2006, which is when I joined, I think, or May, the foundation, an actual organization to, to, to run it, was set up. This system is incredible. This is Munich in 2006. This was the map of Munich on OpenStreetMap. It's not very good. In fact, this is something that Apple should have used to prove how good they were. But this was created by people using, at that point in time, GPS devices, so they were a bit geeky. Now, most of us have smartphones with GPSs in. This is what Stuttgart looks like now. Yeah, that has been done by people with smartphones for nothing. And apart from a few bits, just like Wikipedia, which it is like the wiki of maps, this, this map is free to use. And we contribute to it. It also means that for our services, we use OpenStreetMap, because we can start on our own servers, we can amend it, we can style it. It's there to play with. And we contribute back to it. And the people who use our systems, unless they state otherwise, they contribute back to it. So it just gives an example there of the quality of information. And this is improving at a fantastic rate. Um, so, so if you're ever stuck or you want to find something interesting, please, please have a look at um, OpenStreetMap. And coming back to the, the guy in our office who helped develop Mozilla Firefox, one of the things that collaborative groups don't like is freeloaders. Um, and this shows the converse to it. There's a guy, what's he called, Las Vegas. This is, this is the, the man, in, or the lady, in Stuttgart. This person is responsible for 7.2% of all that information you just saw on that map. And he's at the top of the charts. Yeah, and that's one of the incentives that drives this social um, generation of content or data or, or technology. These are the people who are behind that map. And that's how it works. You create, you upload, and it gets reflected in, in, your, um, in the top 20. Sadly, I'm not even in the top 10 of North Wales, but I, I'm, I'm going to change that one day. About us. So this is how we work and how we collaborate and how we... Um, uh, uh, try to, to create revenues and growth. This is uh, the best we could do as an organizational chat. We're quite flat, so we thought we'd do a circle. There are four of us. That's us there at the bottom, and that's what we look after, the core, the product. On top of that, we've got people who look after the accounts, payroll, um, and also, I forgot, but it didn't fit in. There's somebody looking after legal, yeah? So those are the people that, that, that sustain the actual business in terms of making sure that we're not liable for something or that we're not negligent and that we pay our staff and tax on time. Above that, we've got five people who look after marketing and sales. None of them are based in North Wales. There's people based in Basingstoke um, and Leicester who look after telesales. Um, and our marketing director um, is based in London. So they're all over the country. Technical. What do we mean by technical? We're talking about developers who develop non-core parts of what we do. We can't do everything. What we have to do is control the center, look after the product. But when a new client wants a new mobile application, we will farm that out. The cost is inbuilt into the cost to the actual project. If those costs raise it to above, beyond a certain level, then we'll take on staff member number five. But those are based in, um, well, we'll show you a map, I think. That's, that's where they're based. It's a good way to actually demonstrate it rather than talk about it is the map. So that's us in the ring at the top in the remote parts of North Wales, but we're spread across the UK. That's where people do things for us, whether it's looking after our IP, developing code, or running the payroll. Um, and in terms of breaking it down into what we're doing, our user experience, the person who reviews how our systems work to the end user, they're based in Shoreditch. So we are quite close to Silicon Roundabout there. Um, PRs in Cardiff, 
um, content is actually spread is actually in Derbyshire because we're with the tourism products. We actually need that to be written by an expert. We don't have that expertise. And these are the partners. These are the people who help us to create products. Um, there's three of them. Um, two of them are considerably larger than us, and one's at a similar stage to us. Um, Esri, they're the world's biggest mapping technology firm. They're worth over a billion dollars. Um, and we're very fortunate to be one of their two partners in the UK and now working on their cloud product. Head office is in Redlands in California. I think the time at the moment in California is 4 a.m., which gives you some indication that you can't just pick up the phone and, and deal with them that way. TradeShift um, are Europe's largest startup, if such a thing exists. They're worth $200 million, massive investment from PayPal. They do free invoicing. They're actually a collaborative community where, where you can collaborate with your customers, etc., both with purchasing and invoicing. And we write apps that sit on their platform. They're based in Copenhagen. And interestingly, they started up in a collaborative manner. The guy who set them up was a European expert on something very technical to do with payment called XBL, I think. Um, and he decided the world needed one of these things. So via Twitter, only two years ago, he went out and said, I need 50 developers. I can't give you any money, but I can give you equity. That's how this company started up that now employs about 180 people in America, UK, and Denmark. The company was set up collaboratively with developers who could see the opportunity and the reputation of this guy, so they went in with him. And they've been incredible for us to work with as well. It's, it's been a, a really good experience. And Bookery are a company that deal with the part of our product that we're not that good at, and they've turned out to be a lot better than us, so we collaborate with them. Luckily, they're actually a cycle right away, so that one's a little bit easier to deal with. This, so this, that's, that's a view of, of the people we work with. These are where our customers are. Um, it's come as quite a shock to us. Um, I think the business plan said the UK, and ambitiously we said the EU. That was the, um, that was the initial point. Um, we had a little party when we got South Africa. Um, and it's spread since then, so there's about 140 users of some of our products based around that. I don't know what we've done to upset South America, um, but everywhere apart from South America and Antarctica, now we have, we have clients, and it's growing at a rate of about two to three a week, which doesn't sound that impressive, but it cheers us up a fair bit. And they use our products, we support them from Wales, um, we, we respond to their requirements from Wales, um, it, it seems to be working fine. We don't have to market individual. This is all done via trade shift and via Esri. So what we're trying to say there is that for us at the moment, that seems to be the case. It might not be the case when we're collecting hay with chip, but when we're actually working with people to develop products and sell, it doesn't appear to be an object. The, sort of the, the, the promise that, um, that, that the web sort of spells out has, has definitely been the case for us. Now, actually using these things, how do we actually work together? Well, the first thing that I've got to say is, apart from um, the guys in California, pretty much everybody, we see them at least two or three times a year. Some cases, once or twice a month. You can't value knowing how many sugars somebody takes in their tea as a, as a, a means of getting on better and understanding each other. It's, digital is no substitute for, for actually knowing somebody if you can. So if it means us getting off our rear ends and driving to Basingstoke, which isn't a pleasant experience. Sorry if anybody comes from Basingstoke. Um, we go there because you need to meet them, you need to know them, because it, that, that supports and enhances how you work. This is um, it's a no-brainer. Um, like the car, like the railway, um, like the telegraph, the phone is pretty much the, the digital medium that we use. Whether it's the landline, which seems to be mainly PPI, or the mobile, um, this is how we communicate with our partners and our customers. It's, it's not imaginative, I can't really boast about it, but that's what we use. This, an awful lot of email, that, that's a tool that we use. If used correctly, it's fantastic. If abused, it becomes sort of something that you ignore, and the new, no matter how good Macs are, the new mail client is, is helping me to avoid several of, of those where, where required. As I said, I'm not a geek, um, the developers are, they use that a lot. Yeah, they're working in different places. They're working in Denmark. They're working in Edinburgh. They're working in Glastonbury. They're working in Worcester. They're working in Carnarvon and Bangor. 
this is how they seem to communicate. It's not a fantastic product. We can't say that it's, you know, it can be any variety. And what do they do? They, they um, complain about the quality of management at GeoShow. They sort each other's code problems out because it's perfect for them. Um, so that's what they use. So a pattern begins to emerge that what we're really saying there is there's no, that we've discovered there's no one product or way to collaborate digitally together. There's a, it's a toolbox of different tools for different purposes and functions. And these are the tools that we use. And just as an example of one of them, um, the one where it's Zendesk. Zendesk is um, an online cloud-based support system. It's cheap. Um, it, before, we'd have had to have something sat on our desktop. What this allows us to do is, in the case of TradeShift, if TradeShift have a customer support problem, guess what? They use Zendesk too. So their ticket passes to us automatically. So we're, we're sort of collaborating together even via our customers. If our code, um, we used to have to worry about our code being lost, it's now on the cloud. So we can share it, we can work on it, we can go back a version. Our project management systems are on the cloud, our customer relation management systems are on the cloud. We're basically using the cloud um, in different ways for different tasks. There's an example of, of what we do, um, our project management system is based on an agile method which is basically to-do lists. They dress it up as something a lot more than that, but it's simple sentences explaining a person's requirements. Anybody can get into that, our clients can get into that, we can get into that, we're actually kind of quite transparent. The issue comes though, that's fine with most of our clients, but when we work with Esri, we can't choose. So it becomes a little bit more complicated when they want us to collaborate with them, we have to use what they tell us to use, which doesn't go down well in the office sometimes, but at least it's allowing us to communicate with, with each other and update each other on how progress is actually working. Our customers, we collaborate with them using Basecamp in particular because that's how they react with us in terms of what the product is, but we also with Zendesk in order to provide support. The problems behind this, I've just described it mainly. The first one is complexity. It, it's nice having a separate tool for each job, but sometimes you wish you could have a, a Drexel unit that would work in the same way. Other issues are people might be concerned about security. We do have security policies, different passwords, different networks, so we don't feel that that's a problem at this point in time. Neither do we deal in personal data or financial transactions. Um, there are issues in terms of just the fact that in California it's four o'clock in the morning. The main one is that people worry about IP. We're having external people working on our work, but to us, we're not here to um, protect our IP, we're there to exploit it. So when James Dyson gives us that kind of a stat, it gives us some comfort, however naive that might sound. The advantages are just manifold. Um, we, we can communicate asynchronously, which is a techie term, I'm sorry, but it means that messages can be left for people and they can pick them up at different times. We can respond to them. People can provide solutions. We don't require a postage stamp and you don't need a phone for everything. It means that, particularly for us, the advantages are that we can live in Carnarvon, a big advantage, that we don't have to be in Silicon Valley. And we do that to survive. We've already said that, but what we're hoping will happen is that using these tools, as particularly with the way our products are developing over the next six to 12 months, they'll allow us to actually um, flourish and grow. Thank you very much.